Hey, let's get into the part three of the Halloween franchise timeline. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all doing well out there. Today we're going to get into my part three of my Halloween franchise timeline review. But before we do it, like, comment, subscribe. Join me here. Great. would appreciate that. After the backlash of Halloween 3 season of Witch, although it did make a little bit of money, but the fans weren't happy. The critics lambasted it. They didn't, nobody knew what to do with the Halloween franchise. Jo uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill did not want, had no plans of continuing the Michael Myers storyline, and they owned part of the rights. Mustafa Kod <coughs> wanted to bring Michael back. So for years, there was no movement on the Halloween, with the Halloween franchise. So finally, about 87, Carpenter and Hill sold their rights to Mustafa Kod, who brought in Dwight Little, and Alan B. McElroy helped Dwight Little craft a script, and off they went to Salt Lake City to film Halloween for the return of Michael Myers, because what the fans wanted, and Mustafa Kod wanted to go back to basics. And that they did. Now we're introduced to, we see where Michael Myers, what has happened to him on Halloween Eve, he is being transferred from this mental institution where he's been since he got blown up in, in 78. He's wrapped in bandages. He hasn't been awake. He's been in a coma since that night. And he's being transferred to a new facility. He, he wakes up because he finds out he has a niece in his hometown. And he kills everybody in the ambulance. And he is on the loose again, heading back to Hattonfield to wreak more carnage. We're reintroduced to Dr. Loomis. We're introduced to Jamie Lloyd and Rachel and her family. And she is Laurie Strode's daughter. Laurie Strode has passed away. And now Michael sets his sights on this little girl. And this is a really good reintroduction of the Michael Myers character and Dr. Loomis and Hattonfield. Um, Dwight Little does a nice job here. Um, he tries to take it back to what Carpenter tried to create in the original. Now, we all know that Carpenter did not want to make Laurie Strode the sister of Michael Myers, but he did it out of desperation, and they were falling through with it here. They kept that storyline going because now he's after his niece. And there's a, Michael is... George Wilbur plays Michael, and he's terrific here. The mask is okay. I'm not big on the mask in Halloween 4. But we get some great kills. We get some great suspense. And it's an interesting story and a good way to reboot or bring back the Halloween franchise and give everybody what they want, which was Michael Myers killing people. And that they did. Now, Michael gets shot into the mine shaft at the end of this movie. And then Jamie, after touching him, we think, anyway, until, you, until 5 came out, that Jamie was going to take over the franchise because she stabs her stepmother in the tub. And she Loomis sees her standing at the top of the steps, covered in blood and holding the shears. And that's the end of Halloween 4. Well, the producer said, fuck that shit, because everybody wants to shape killing people. So that happened, but Jamie is not continuing on as Michael Myers. So in 5, we have where Jamie cannot speak. And Loomis is a psychotic asshole. And they kill Rachel off in the first 20 minutes. And they bring in the, the man in black, which they had to explain in part 6. But this is a continuation of Halloween 4. This picks up right after, like during the moments of the ending of Halloween 4. And then when they fast forward here. I have my problems with Halloween 5. You can check out my Halloween 5 review that just got released. Um, it's on my Halloween playlist. Um, when I was a kid, I loved that film. It doesn't hold up that well. I mean, it does continue right after part 4. But they do a lot of things wrong where part four did a lot of things right. And basically killing Rachel off in the first 20 minutes after how much we grown to love her in part four was a huge mistake. And then your main character, Jamie, is doesn't speak for three quarters of the film until the end of the film when she finally starts talking again. And then they didn't bring Daniel Harris back in part six anyway. But then they bring on the question of what's this tattoo on Michael's wrist and who's the man in black? And they never answer any of that shit. And at the end of the film, we let, we're left with that cliffhanger where the man in black busts Michael out of prison, shoots all the cops, blows up the cell door, gets Michael out, and that's Daniel Harris, well, Jamie's crying, and that's the end of part five. And it's like, well, what the, what the hell was that? Well, part six had to answer all those questions. And Daniel Farrens came in and wrote a script that they tried to follow. Joe Chappelle came in to direct that film, and I saw this one. This is my first Halloween film I got to see theatrically. Um, Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. And I was excited because I loved the series so far, even 5 at that point. And it was a great night. It was in September it got released and I got to go see it with my friends and it was a great experience. And I still like Part 6. We'll go, go over it a little bit here. We're reintroduced to Jamie, not played by Daniel Harris because Dimensions cheaped out and didn't give her, I think it was over $5,000 or something. That's what I've read over the years. 
Michael, Jamie is in this facility, we don't know, in these underground caverns and these people are performing a ritual and she has a baby that later on we find that Michael raped her and she got pregnant and they're doing some kind of ceremony. This nurse breaks, lets Jamie get out with her baby and Michael is stalking her and kills Jamie pretty quickly into the movie in a gruesome and graphic way in the theatrical cut anyway. Because there's two different cuts of this film. The producers and the theatrical film, if you're a Halloween fan, I'm, assuming, I'm sure you've seen both of these films because the producer's cut was a hot item back in the day. I remember buying a version, a VHS version off of uh, eBay. That's how I got to see it for the first time in a shitty transfer. But at least you could see their intentions um, with that eBay VHS tape that I had. Now it's, I have it on Blu-ray, but back then you had to deal with that shitty transfer on VHS that you bought, overpaid for. I think I paid 40 bucks for that fucking tape. My God. But it was cool, and I'm a huge Halloween fan, so I was more than happy to pay just to see that version of the film. Paul Rudd plays Tommy Doyle here. They bring that character back. Um, Halloween had been banned in Hattonfield, and the kids are trying to bring it back. The college kids are starting to want Halloween to come back, and we get that shock jock in there that's supposed to be like Howard Stern light. George Wilbur came back to play Michael Myers. John Carl Beekler's guys came in to redo the mask, and then this is the best the mask has looked since the original film in part six. Um, definitely. I love the mask here. I love George Wilbur's portrayal of Michael Myers. Now, in this film, this film was the first film that Trankus or Mustafa Khan had done with Dimensions, and there was a lot of behind-the-scenes problems. But we're introduced to new characters, Tommy Doyle comes back, and we're led to believe that when the guy that we saw in Halloween 1 talking to Loomis when Michael broke out, the head of Smith's Grove, is the man in black. And they've been taking care of Michael all these years. Now, a lot of this doesn't make sense in the conjunction of Halloween 1 and 2. But with 4, 5, and 6, they were looking to explain some of this stuff. And I like the cult aspect. It was somewhere to take it new after this being the sixth film and all. But at this point, Donald Pleasance was really old. Uh, he died shortly after production wrapped on this film. So when they did reshoots, which is what the theatrical version became... He was no longer around, so they had to use whatever footage they had to splice into the film. And basically at the end, he got the thorn symbol on his wrist, and he screams at the end, and that's pretty much it. This is a mess of a film. I've always liked it, because I think it looks cool. There's some great atmosphere. I like the amped up score. I prefer the, the producer's cut by a little bit. I think it's more interesting, and it's more what a Halloween movie, what we typically think of a Halloween movie. It's not as flashy. Um, the score sounds more like Carpenter's original intent of his score. Um, but these three films, the fourth one's definitely the best film out of the three. I mean, they all continue on, and this one had to do a lot of heavy lifting in part six to explain the dumpster fire that they started in part five. I think they do a decent job with it, but it's so choppy, especially the theatrical version. It's so choppy, and some shit comes out of nowhere that I don't think you ever get the satisfied answers, really. And even in the producer's cut, you get more answers and more of the Thorn stuff. But even if you ever see the documentary about Part 6, they even said we would have made even more changes and did even more with that to flesh it out. But they never got the chance because the Weinsteins pulled rank. Mustafa Khan and his people had to sit and decide why they went off to L.A. to do reshoots. And we got that choppy mess of a film that was released theatrically. Although I still enjoy that cut. I can sit down and have a good time with it, even though it's batshit crazy. But yeah, this is a mess of a film. This is a mess of a trilogy, honestly, because part four started off strong and then five was it's kind of a dumpster fire. And this one was a mess because there was a lot of infighting behind the scenes and they couldn't figure out which way to go. And then the Weinsteins pulled their shit and that's what we got released in 95 when this got released. But I like part six. Part six is definitely better than part five. It's better directed. I like George Wilbur's portrayal. It's a shame that they cheaped out and didn't bring Daniel Harris back. Um, she deserved to come back and get a bigger role. I don't like how to even handle that character in this film. Although at least in the producer's cut, she gets a little more to do and she doesn't get killed off. So, well, she does kind of get killed off shit, pretty shitty. But still, it's a mess of a trilogy. That's why they did H2O after this. And then, because where were they going to go after this? I mean, I would have liked to have seen the Thorn aspect maybe, maybe talked about or dealt with a little bit more. But... We're never going to see it. So this isn't a little contained trilogy within the, the Halloween timeline. Um, I know part four has nothing to do with the Thorn stuff. Nothing to do with the Man in Black. But they, it's called online, unofficially, the Thorn trilogy. And you can see why. I mean, they do follow each other. Although it becomes a more of a mess than a mess as we go along. But yeah, 
that's pretty much Halloween 4, 5, and 6, the Thorn Trilogy. What are your thoughts on this trilogy? Which film of these three is your favorite? Leave a comment down below. Let me know. Hit the thumbs up. Hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel. I greatly would appreciate that. I'll be back soon with some more reviews, but until then, bye.